Now I believe we have this line. And if you go over the line, even if you're a piano player or a cook or a banker or a doctor or a seal or whatever you are, if you go over that line and push too hard, something's going to break down. Either physically, something will break down. Maybe your marriage or your relationship you might have with somebody, or you're not paying enough attention to your kids because you're giving too much. But we all have an imaginary line and everything we do, I believe, that if you go over it, it's harmful. So now what I, I believe now is I believe we have to know where that line is, but just go up and touch it and then back off. Then come up and touch it again and back off. So you're not damaging other parts of your life. Welcome to Mindset Lessons from the Field. I'm Gina Kazaza, the author of the upcoming memoir, Training with the Seal. Today, we have a fantastic guest. He was on SEAL Team 1, 2, and 6. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He has competed in over 1,000 competitive races, and he believes that anyone can achieve anything with a proper mindset, making him the perfect guest for my podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you, Don Mann. Welcome to the show, Don. Oh, thank you, Gina. It's nice to be here talking with you. I'm so excited to have you. Let's just get right into it. Let's get into why you are on my show. So you were a SEAL, which is the main reason you were on my show. And then as I was digging deeper into getting to know you before this show, I found out you're you're a beast of a man. And I, I mean that in the best way possible. I mean... I just find it very compatible. Like, I found out from doing my research, correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a time in your life where you were invited to go for a run with a friend and you quit in the middle of running and you sat and watched your friend finish the run because it was just hard. And you, I correct me if I'm wrong, you didn't like running. Is that, is that accurate statement? Well, you know, everything is what you just said. That That's so accurate. I've quit two things in my life. And that was the very first time I quit anything. And I was a young teenager and I raced motocross, motorcycles in the dirt. And um, I really didn't have real direction or I didn't have a mindset at all. But I knew I wanted to be a champion. And so I trained. I had fun and all that. But a friend of mine called me one day and he was a, pro a professional motocross racer and he was a champion. And he asked me to train with him one day. And I was so honored that a professional motocross racer would ask me to train with him. And he said, well, what I do, I run 10 miles at a time. I do it three days a week. Would you like to run with me and train with me? I said, absolutely, yes. No matter what you tell me to do, I'll do. You're, you're a professional. I'm nobody. And uh, we were teenagers. And um, he talked. I never ran in my life up till this first day here. I didn't run in school or any, I didn't see the point of running at all. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so we, it was 10 laps he had, that was in North Haven, Connecticut. And we did one lap and he wasn't talking or anything. He was so focused on just moving forward, forward sustained movement is what I saw in him. And he just went hard and fast and he didn't get, um, you know, he didn't lose his interest or his focus on what he was doing by talking to me or doing anything else just going forward. But the first mile was hard. I didn't like it at all. It was the furthest I ever ran at that point was a mile because I wasn't a runner. And then the second mile, it was even harder than the first mile. And the third mile, I just quit. I quit and I sat on the grass and I watched Dave run four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 miles. But during that time he was running and I was just sitting in the grass relaxed. I realized the difference between Dave and I is he works really hard and pushes himself through the pain and he does that and he gets to where he is which is professional me at the time i felt uncomfortable i made excuses for myself why i should quit and i just quit and it was a lesson that lasted me a lifetime and i'm glad it happened you know he was he was fed up with me he was disgusted like you know why don't you go train somewhere else you know if you're serious about this you would pick out a running race and train for that race and that'll get you motivated to run. And then that'll make you a better motocross racer because you'd have more endurance and stamina. I said, Dave, I didn't know they had running races. I didn't know this. 
He said, yep, they have them all over the place. And I asked him when the next one was, and he said, Boston Marathon. And it was in like just a couple months away. And I said to him, I said, uh, how long is the marathon? He said, 26.2 miles. I said, no way. People don't run that far. And he gave me Dr. Sheehan's first book of running. And one of the last chapters was Boston or Bust. But I read a lot about people who had organ transplants and prosthetic legs and cancer survivors and really old people and really young people who ran this 26.2 mile course in Boston. And I was thinking, I'm just a young kid. I should be able to put one leg in front of the other and not quit. So I just promised myself, it's the first hard thing I ever did. I would just run without stopping at Boston Marathon. I would just run and not stop to walk. And when I was at mile 17, Bill Rogers had just won. And I was thinking, man, I got nine more miles to go. But I just kept putting one leg in front of the other, and it worked. I ran a marathon nonstop as a non-runner, and it hurt a lot. But then I did another one a month later to try to better that time. Then I did 30 more within the three-year time span, and a lot of them are 50 miles or 100 Ks. And I became a runner just with the mindset, don't stop and push yourself welcome the pain. If it's worth doing, it's just going to hurt. And I I just changed my whole life philosophy from that one run. So do you like running now? Well, I became a runner and I ran for the next 40 years pretty hard. Now it's a little difficult to run on the roads because it just hurts. But I, run, I, I live in the mountains here and I run in the mountains three or four times a week. I love it. Wow. So you said something that I that was really interesting where you said I didn't have the mindset and how did you, how did you develop that mindset? How did you push past the pain of, you know, I get it one foot in front of the other that, and I'm just not going to stop. But when it is painful and your mind is just like picturing you on the couch, relaxing, like how do you push past that pain? And how did you develop that mindset from having no mindset? I believe it was just by having a goal and and not get wishy-washy on that goal. Like to establish a firm goal, which is finishing a marathon, mm-hmm. just having a goal. And it really didn't matter to me what shape I was in at that point, because the goal was you're going to run a marathon nonstop and just going to do it. If I was in really, really good shape, it wouldn't have been so painful. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't a runner yet, so I wasn't in running shape. And um, it didn't matter to me how much pain was involved. And I don't know where that came from. But I do know, I, if I can tell you, one, one thing I did learn, the marathon went on to longer, longer runs, multi-day runs. And then I started doing the Ironman triathlons. And that was a 2.4 swim, 112-mile bike ride, then a 26-mile run right afterwards. So the marathon was only a portion of this race. And then I'd always set my goals high. I call them macro goals. I'd accomplish it. And then the next macro goal had to be bigger than the previous macro goal. So at one point, my macro goal was to finish an Ironman and to finish it beating the champion's time. Somehow, I managed to do that on my second Ironman. I, I beat wow. the champion's time. He he. Well, back then, the times were so much slower than now. But it was uh, he did it in 11 hours and 44 minutes. And I actually passed him on the course. And with great respect, I said, have a great race, champ. And I couldn't believe I passed my idol. You know? <laughs> and then uh, so then I went on and somehow without really knowing what I was doing, I did it 1141. I broke his time and it, it occurred to me that he was probably in way better shape than I was. And so were all the other athletes in the in that race. And I ended up being 38th in the world that year. But I believe most of those guys were in better shape than I was. But I also believe I had a stronger mindset where it was push yourself hard. Mm-hmm. It's worth it. It's it's um it's really worth it. And and the the to answer your question, I think what happened, I took that macro goal of just finishing an Iron Man. And then I was thinking, what's next? What's going to be the next macro goal? But beating Gordon Haller's time, he did 11.44 and I did 11.41. So I was able to do an Ironman under 12 hours. So my next macro goal was I'm going to do two Ironmans in a day. So I I, uh, figured, okay, if I could do one in 12 hours, I could do one 
one in less than you know a day. So I was doing that. I felt fine in the water. Then the 224 mile bike ride, and now there's two marathons left. And I was thinking, only two marathons left. My mindset was just that strong now. And I did one marathon. Then I was thinking, ah, this is just about over. Just one marathon to go. But about mile 32 or so, I started seeing the white stars and things got blurry and I started dry heaving the bile and all. And then I passed out and um, I was on the lawn kind of sleeping. And, and when I woke up, I saw runners and cyclists going by and I was wondering why I was sleeping outside initially. I was like, what am I sleeping outside here for? And then I said, oh boy, I'm in a double Ironman. I better get up and finish. And I liked the way that that happened because it taught me that all the other times I might have given up or thought it was too hard or started feeling sorry for myself, I was wrong. Because if something is really too hard, I realized your body gives you the break and you'll pass out for a short period of time. You get up and then you have the energy to keep going. And, and that's what happened. So I never felt ever anything was too hard. I always felt if it is too hard, I'll pass out. I'll get up and finish. I do have a caveat to mention on that because my mindset's strong now. It's really strong. But if I didn't bleed, hallucinate, bonk, or pass out by doing some hard event, I thought I was leaving something home at the table and I wasn't giving it my all. And But I hurt myself a lot. And I did that for decades. You know, I really, really, really I hallucinated so much. I bled so much. I passed out so much. I bonked so much, you know, when you just give everything. So now I don't believe that's the case. Mm -hmm. Now I believe we have this line. And if you go over the line, even if you're a piano player or a cook or a banker or a doctor or a seal or whatever you are, if you go over that line and push too hard, something's going to break down. Either physically, something will break down. Maybe your marriage or your relationship you might have with somebody. Or you're not paying enough attention to your kids because you gave them too much. But we all have an imaginary line and everything we do, I believe, that if you go over it, it's harmful. So now what I, I believe now is I believe we have to know where that line is. But just go up and touch it and then back off then come up and touch it again and back off. So you're not damaging other parts of your life. Because I really did quite a bit of damage to my body. And, um, you know, I don't have any regrets at all because it was all a 40-year learning experience, 50-year. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's been a lot of fun. And, and I really, really enjoy ex sharing those experiences with other people in hopes that maybe it'll help and encourage them to push themselves more. Because I do believe, Gina... When I got out of the teams and um, I was always around these hardcore motivated people. And then I started looking around that a lot of people aren't that motivated and a lot of people take life kind of easy and they do lay on the couch quite a bit and they don't, they set goals low and they reach their goals and they're happy about it rather than setting the goals high and trying to achieve those. And um, so I, I really believe if I had to sum up what my life was all about, is high goal setting and having a strong mindset. And your mindset can get stronger each and every day. Your, your body won't necessarily get stronger each and every day, but your mindset can. Today's podcast episode is brought to you by my absolute favorite company. If you know me or seen videos or photos of me, then you know I always have one on my wrist. I absolutely adore this company. DiscoverOmnia.com. DiscoverOmnia.com is the world's first smart crystal bracelet. Every single bracelet is handmade in the USA using real genuine crystals made on memory wire. Every bracelet is unisex and they're also aromatherapy. The cool part is the black onyx charm that is on the bracelet. It scans to your cell phone, connecting you to their wellness hub Elevate. You can also access their Wellness Hub Elevate on your computer or tablet. You just have to sign into your account. The bracelet gives you a 12 month membership. It has over 200 pieces of self care content from motivational tips, meditations, breathing exercises, exercises around the theme of your bracelet, printable journals, and so much more. The content is ever growing. Nuts and all. The bracelet also gives you lifetime access 
to their Elevate Together Club, which meets monthly via Zoom. Each month is themed, giving you actionable takeaways to elevate your life. And with this podcast episode, you get 40% off your purchase order by using the code Mindset Podcast. Use that code Mindset Podcast for 40% off. Just go to discoveromnia.com. Discoveromnia.com, code Mindset Podcast for 40% off. Get your bracelet today. I remember when I was training and I, my body was physically giving out and I, and I had to keep telling myself like, this is so much fun. Just one foot in front of the other, like, don't, you know, just keep going. And yet my body was like, just done. How do you push past that physical pain to not quit, not stop the body. Because I noticed for myself, I would stop the body, even with my mindset going, be, being positive and going, and my body would just just stop. Like, and, um, and yet I still had gas in the tank. I was still able to keep on going. So how do you push past that? Um, I think most situations when those things happen, I think you don't have to stop. You can just slow down. Okay. You can just slow down. And even as a runner, as a runner, um, I did this with my nine-year-old grandson the other day. Mm. I said, uh, you don't have to run up the hills. Walk fast up the hills and just run on the flats and the downhills. And on and running, for instance, if um if you do end up walking, I believe you give your running muscles a break. And when you're running, you give your walking muscles a break. So if you're out there, like I did a 63-mile run once. And it was really hilly. So when I when I was walking up the hills real fast, my running muscles were getting a break. And when I'd run the flats and downhills and some of the uphills, um, my walking muscles got a break. So I always felt in my mind anyways that half the muscles were getting a break most half the time. Did you find that when you did stop or slow down? Well, not stop. I shouldn't say stop. When you slowed down a bit, did you find it challenging to start up again? Like it took a lot more energy to just get that engine going again? No, I don't think I ever felt that. But I, I think if that happens, maybe you, your slowdown period wasn't long enough, perhaps, you know, and maybe you can look at the next hill and say, okay, I'm going to just walk up that hill. And after that, then I'll start running again. And if you, I know we're not really talking about running, but when you get to the top of a hill, if you use the little bit of a downhill to get you going again, it's kind of like a kickstart. Um, so I always try to find little tricks like that. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. Um, let me ask you, when you were training, when you were, well, you were running before you decided to go be a Navy SEAL, correct? Yeah. So you had some training under your belt before you went into it. Actually, I did two Ironmans before becoming a SEAL. Yeah. Wow. So I I was listening to an interview and you mentioned how you just told yourself, like, this is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done, like going through Navy SEAL training. And then when you got there, you were like, it wasn't so hard because you mentally prepared yeah. for that. Right. So. Yeah. How do you mentally prepare for something when your body is going through such physical pain that it's that it's never done like before? Well, um, I think I had an advantage going through BUDS, basic underwater demolition seal school, because I love physical activity and exercise and working out hard. Mm -hmm. And I loved it. So they could have us on the grinder doing sit-ups and push-ups all day long. I I, I enjoy that. I, I do enjoy it, but I think I think what I did, I know I did this for four years because it took me four years to finally get to SEAL training. I was stationed with the Marines and they wouldn't release me. And it's, that's a long story. But when I finally got my orders to BUDS, I had done so much training, but I also did a lot of visualization and I would picture how cold those swims are going to be and how long they're going to be and how my tailbone is going to get all bloody and chewed up from doing the sit-ups on the grinder and how the hell week's going to be without sleeping for, for a week. 
And I was just picturing how is the toughest military training in the world going to feel? But what I did, I think through the power of visualization is, and I did this every day, not consciously sometimes, but I'd always, always think about how hard it was going to be. And um, I learned to adopt the philosophy, just welcome the pain. If it's worth doing, it's just going to be painful. But also every day when I finished training, you know, Spuds is just a little over six months long. Every day I'd get back to my room or wherever we were sleeping. And um, I realized, wow, today was really, really hard, but not nearly as hard as I thought it would, it would be. And I think mainly from visualizing that it would be much more difficult than it was. And I would have done it again up until I was probably 45 years old or so. I mean, I would definitely have taken that challenge again. And now I'd break in pieces, <laughs> but uh, I, I would definitely have done it, you know, for again, all those years up until I was probably 45-ish or so. I'd be slow. I wouldn't be able to keep up with the fast, mostly guys, but I would still have done it. So again. how long was that visualization? Like how long when you were in the Marines, did you know, I want to be a Navy SEAL? And when you made that conscience choice, how long were you visualizing up until you you went to butt? Almost four years. Four yep. years. Yep, almost wow. four years, yeah. Because it it's a long, boring, big Navy story. But uh, I joined, I went to my recruiter and he showed me the, an interview and a video of these guys going through buds. And back then, not much was known about SEAL team. Mm -hmm. And that video changed my whole life. I was saying, that's what I want to be. I want to be, you know, running on the beach and blowing things up and shooting things and skydiving and diving and shooting and just being really fit and going all over the world, fighting for our country. All of that is what I wanted. It was like a perfect, if I could have created a job, that would have been it. Mm -hmm. So then what also, what Gene, what, whatever, another thing that made it easier for me, I think, and I think this is good for anybody wanting to do something like that, is not having a backup plan. Because so many guys, you know, they, they feel like they're being tortured and harassed and just all this exercise. It's easier to switch and think, well, you know, maybe I'll go be a pilot or maybe I'll go do something else. But if you don't have a backup plan thinking this is it, I mean, you really don't have a choice but to keep going. I think that helped a lot too. So that's a really, um, that's an amazing point for civilian life um, and how people um, don't, like you mentioned in the beginning, they don't have big enough goals. You know, they they hit that, they don't reach their potential, you know, their goals are smaller. So how was it for you when you went into civilian life and, and left the SEALs to, um, to help others um, hit those, hit those potentials and hit those highs? Like, how do you, how do you do something like that? Well, what I had to do when I first, then I went right to work for the U S government like the day I got out of the teams, but I did it as a, a part-time person. So I was spending a lot of time in Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, all those, the dirt tour, we call it, and all those places. But I only did it part-time. And that that answered my craving to be where there's action and where there's excitement and where it could still be part of the solution, you know, the U.S. Uh, solution. Um, but the adventure the adventure side the athletic side wasn't being met so immediately my life was always divided in two seal or government was one side but the other side was you know going from motorcycle racer to runner to ultra distance runner to triathlete to ultra triathlete to adventure racing and then to mountaineering and the adventure races then just were starting up and they were the 500 mile 600 mile 10 day races, which is the hardest thing I've ever done. It was harder than SEAL training because you're basically, you're still with a small group of people, three or four guys or and a lady and a woman. And, um, and you're climbing mountains and swimming up to like, I've done a 17 mile swim in one of these and um, mountain biking and climbing and horseback riding, but you go nonstop for 10 or 11 days and really I always hallucinated in those, always. And because, like, for instance, once I had to stop paddling 
And it was, we were paddling for two days nonstop. And my buddy said, Don, what's the matter? And I said, and this is in the Amazon. I said, I don't want to hit that beautiful Japanese girl who came up right in front of the boat in a full dress kimono. I mean, I was totally hallucinating, you know, and, um, but those happened. And then I produced a bunch of them. I actually produced more than anybody in the world at one point. And I, I love talking to the athletes during the race or at the finish line and say, so what were your hallucinations? And they're fascinating. And it's really because you, you beat your mind and you overpower it and your mind saying, you better stop, you better stop, you better stop. But you blast through that and you keep going, you keep going. Then you start hearing things and you see things and you hallucinate. And to me, I knew I was giving it my all when those things would happen. I don't do that anymore. Now I back off before that happens. <laughs> so, you know, I, I spoke earlier about thinking and feeling and how they're very different, you know, um, but how is it when the thinking and the feeling is similar as the same when you're thinking like, you know, I can't do this anymore. Like this is, this is too much for me and the physical body you're feeling it. And you're like at that, you're touching that line. You're going a little bit past that. You're touching that line. Um, how do you then, how do you readjust your mindset during that time period? That's, that's only happened to me twice in my life mm -hmm. when, um, I thought, uh, I'm not going to go on. This is too hard. And, um, the second time it happened, it was the worst experience of my whole life and it happened in buds. And what was happening, and, and and I did that visualization four years, like I mentioned, to go get ready for buds. And I was ready. I mean, I just felt the moment I walked in there very quietly and humbly in my mind, I was saying to myself, bring it on. I welcome the pain. If you hurt me too much, I'll just pass out on you. But bring it on. I'm going to do everything you say because I'm going to be a seal. I mean, that was my attitude, you know. Um, so I, I practiced everything you had to practice, all the physical activities that they throw on you there, except for a pool day we had. And, um, that time there, what, what you needed to do was <clears throat> you had to stand on the side of the pool, do a forward flip in the air, go back in the water and swim underwater, do a flip turn and come back for 50 meters. And I never practiced that. And I wasn't a swimmer. I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't a swimmer at all. And um, they said, all you have to do is don't quit. And if you pass out underwater, shallow water blackout, we'll pull you up. Just don't quit. If you really think you need to breathe, exhale a little bit. That'll get rid of the CO2. But don't quit. If you quit, you're weak. You're, I won't say the words that tell you, <laughs> but um, then you're going to be over here and we, we don't want anything to do with you. So every single training evolution, I just attacked and I loved it all. But this was brand new to me. So I did my forward flip in the air and went in the water. I started swimming to the other side, but my head started to hurt because of not breathing. And I was exhaling a little bit, like they said. I made it to the other side, did a flip turn. And then on the way back, my head was really, really hurting. It felt like an ice pick going in and out of my head. And I was coming back. I was saying, oh, my God, this hurts so much, so, so much. I started feeling sorry for myself and all that. I said, I can't take it. I can't take it. And I shot to the surface and I quit. And uh, when you quit there, you know, there's no lower being in this life, you know, as being a quitter in the teams. They said, get over there, quitter. And, um, you know, we had a class of 125 or so at that point. But only eight people had passed it initially. And all of us were quitters. And I felt so, so small because I quit something. It's the only thing in my life I wanted. There's nothing else. I didn't have a backup plan, like I mentioned. All I wanted to do is be a SEAL. And I quit. And I all I had to do is keep going. And if I had passed out, they would have pulled me out of the water. But I felt bad for myself and I quit. And that was the second time I quit anything. The first time was running with my buddy Dave. So they said to the eight or so guys who made it, they said, you want to give these losers another chance? You want to give them another chance? They said, yeah, give them another chance, of course. They're our teammates. So I said a prayer, and I said, oh, man, I just want to do this. No matter what, I'm going to finish this. And I did the flip and went underwater and turned around and came back. And still felt like that ice pick. And I was going underwater as best I could. And when they, I did pass out underwater, and they pulled me up, and I had all the froth coming out of my mouth. And they said, good job. 
<laughs> so <laughs> I made it. <laughs> wow, that's an incredible story. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and uh, a benefactor of that lesson was it saved my life a few years after because I was under a ship. We were doing a ship attack and um, I ran out of oxygen. I ran out of air. And um, I was under there for minutes without air or oxygen. And it was a dark, you know, it was pitch black. And um, and it was a ship attack. You can't get caught under a ship. They throw grenades in the water and just kill everybody. And I was saying, my God, I can't breathe. And I tried uh, shaking my buddy's fin for him to come down to me. And he couldn't see me. I couldn't see him. I, I couldn't feel a mouthpiece in his mouth. I went through my operating procedures, you know, check the O2, make sure the valves are on, the valve is on and the hoses aren't kinked. I did that three times. And now my head was hurting again, just like it did in the pool that day. And I think I get it. I'm going to blow this whole mission. So I swam up to the bottom of the ship and you don't see anything. It's just pitch black. And I was walking my arm over arm over arm to like to the side of the ship, but it was blocked and I couldn't surface and my head was so much worse than it was in the pool that day. And I had one thought that I could just take a deep breath and drown myself and then the pain would be over. But then I was thinking, that's how a quitter thinks. Can't be a quitter. Just keep kicking like they teach you. Don't give up. Just keep kicking. Just kick in and kick in. And I knew my body was getting deeper and deeper and deeper because it was getting colder. Not that you can see anything, but it was just getting colder. But I ended up at the bow of the ship. It was a long ship, too. So I don't know how many minutes had transpired. Then I swam over to the bow side of the ship on the left side. My buddies had the pole and ladder, and they were getting ready. They were climbing the ship to take it over. And I just got in the back of the ladder and went up, and success. Ah. So that, that lesson of buds helped me out. <laughs> wow. What other lessons did you learn from buds that has, like, transformed your life? You know, that you use on on the daily or that has saved your life and i i had a roommate and he was a guy from mexico and he was kind of pudgy and he didn't train that much and i was thinking his name was bill i was thinking oh great i got a roommate who's not going to last another day or two and i get my room for myself that's what i was thinking you know <laughs> and he was terrible he he uh all the swims, he was last. All the runs, he was last. All the obstacle courses, he was lost. Last, he was he's last at everything. But somehow, those buds instructors had hope in him, and they 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 saw something in him the rest of our students didn't see. And he was gradually improving, and he ended up being one of the top of the class. And he recently retired as a war hero. With decorations up to here, they saw something in him we didn't see. So I I think I take from that is you can't really tell how powerful or strong a person is by looking at them. Mm -hmm. But what's in here and here is really all that matters. I think that was a great lesson I learned from buds anyways. So would you say that building the mindset and building that belief in yourself and everything is just from doing hard things from putting yourself through like the most uncomfortable things, the things that you absolutely hate? Yep. Or in my case, I love those uncomfortable things. You could love them too. But mm -hmm. I really do think, too, like you just said, really, it's just challenging yourself. You have to challenge yourself and push yourself no matter what you do in life, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, if I was a cook, I just can't go put hamburgers on a frying pan. I'd want to be a good cook and learn. And, and I think we could all push ourselves in whatever we do. You oh, so, so what I, I do believe is that most people set the goals low and it's easy to accomplish those goals or those objectives or the mission. It's easy. And then if you look at it as a pyramid, all of this lost potential never, ever gets fulfilled. And then the your highest potential you can achieve in life, you don't even know what that is because you just achieve these little low set goals down here and you never achieve to go up higher I, I really do think a lot of people are born, they live, and they die without achieving so many things they could possibly achieve if they only thought a little bit differently, thinking, I got to push myself, I got to. And, and I'm, I don't want to come across like a sadomasochist or anything, because I, I also know that when you really push yourself hard through uncomfortable times and 
and, and events, and that's over, it makes the non-stressful time all the more peaceful and all the, the nicer. It's like the contrast works so well, like I'm pushing, I'm pushing, I'm pushing. Now I'm not pushing. Wow, life is so nice and peaceful. I think there's a contrast. But be ready to push, 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 push for the next thing. Then take the break and enjoy it. So I don't think it's, I don't want to come across like, you know, I'm just some guy who's wanting everybody who listens to what I have to say, try to push themselves and be uncomfortable with their whole lives. So I think it makes the non-stressful times nicer. How do you know when you're hitting that line? Like, how do you know if you are, um, like you kept saying, you just want to go touch the line and back off. How do you know when you are close to the line? Because you know how you physically can feel your body giving out. And they say like, and I don't mean like, like to the point of passing out, but when the pain starts and it starts to hurt. Right. And they say like, you know, you still have 60% in the tank left, you know, and you just have to push, push, push. And you hit a certain threshold where that pain just is gone, you know, and, and you realize, wow, you have so much more to go. So how do you know then when you're hitting that 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 complete limit or how do you know like you still have time to go to hit that limit well one part of that answer i think would be for me anyways i would look at people like papillon or people who like my uncle was a prisoner of war and he was in the death march and the germans pitchforked him into the ground and he survived it and he lived to be 80 something years old i look at people who who have to real suffering and they kept going and they kept going and they kept going where here I'm doing some canned adventures, some organized event somewhere or climbing a mountain when I know I'll be back in at the most two months. And um, it's all really because I asked for this and I want to do it, but all these poor people, you know, native American Indians and what they went through and, and uh, just people who, you know, what's going on in the war zones right now, you know, with Ukraine and Russia and Israel and Palestine, the Hamas controlled area, all those people are suffering so much, way more than I would ever have suffered in any event I ever did. And these young women, young children, old men, I mean, they make it because they don't give up and they keep pushing themselves and they have to for survival. Mm -hmm. So if I just do some canned adventure, it's of my own doing, and um, I have no right to give up in something that simple when it's compared to something that real, um, you know, like, for instance, the war zones and uh, people who are just persecuted and, you know, all the things that happen to people around the world that we're lucky with that doesn't happen to us in the United States. We get to do what we want, basically, and go choose to climb some mountain or something. Yeah, it's going to hurt. So if it does start to hurt, and I do have to save my energy to hit that peak in a day or a week or whatever. I just have to tone it down and know and keep my focus on that peak. Like every day, I'm going to walk a few more steps and get another camp, a few more steps, hit another camp. And I'll make it as long as I can conserve my energy and eat and drink and not get hurt. That I know this is maybe a week or two weeks long. Look at what other people have gone through. For instance, I... And, I, I just saw some children in Ukraine that they had to leave Ukraine. They were uh, from Israel and they were being chased all over the place, Ukraine, trying to stay safe, you know, from the Russians. And then they got deported back to Israel. Now they're doing the same thing in Israel. So their young, their lives as young children are just surviving and trying to, you know, stay safe. They have it way harder than anything I've ever done. And I just choose to be a SEAL and choose to climb mountains and choose to do this thing. It's a, of my own doing. And um, so nothing I have done has been anything as challenging as what so many people in this world go through. Not so much Americans. We're fortunate, but so many people in these, especially war zones and countries that are very impoverished countries. So that's that's how you know, like, in terms of like, um, like your grandfather's story, that's a really interesting story on, um, you know, surviving and, and going through it. And do you tap into that when you are uh, to help motivate you to keep, to keep going? Yeah. The Bataan death march. I think of all those survivors, 
they weren't athletes and they were doing something way more challenging than anything I've ever done. And I know as human beings, we all have that in us mm-hmm. to do that. And um, so if they can do it for survival, I know it's in me to do the same thing in some event or some climb or something. So I, I, those are the people who inspire me. Another, another like a, I like to mention this lady because, you know, on a smaller note, we were climbing the Grand Tetons a few years back, and I did it with a great climber. Actually, I was just, I was in Colorado with him yesterday. He's one of the greatest mountaineers in our country. And uh, so his name is Jay. And Jay and I and a couple other people were climbing the, this Grand Teton climb. It was a two-day climb. And we did it in one day, but we're all climbers. He was the best, but he, we're all climbers and we had the right gear and we we're fit. And, um, you know, it wasn't that bad really, but it was a storm and we all really pushed ourselves and it was hard. And we came down, we did this two day climb in one day. And here we are patting ourselves on the back, like, wow, we are good. <laughs> but what really was a good experience, a humbling experience that I, I enjoyed seeing because it put me right back in my place is a lady came down. She just did what exactly what we did. She wasn't fit. She didn't even have the right gear like what we had. And she is totally blind. So her challenge was way harder than ours. And we were thinking we're so tough. And I, I could only imagine how tough it was for her, not being an athlete, not being a climber and being blind. She had it so much harder than we did. And she was able to do it. Wow. That's, that's an incredible it's it's incredible when you learn like what the human mind i mean what the human body you know what we can do um as individuals and as teams you know um i'm sure you learn to the teamwork and how you guys you know work together instead of um standing alone and did you go into that like did you go into seals understanding and knowing teamwork or was it something that you that you learned? Boy, you know, I, I think I've never been asked that question, but I think I learned teamwork in the teams because up to that point, I didn't really do many team sports, just backyard type sports. And I really, I was with the Marines before as a SEAL and I probably started developing teamwork experiences and, and lessons with the Marines, but not nearly as much as I learned from being a SEAL where, um, you know, when I left the Marines to become a SEAL, it was, you know, going from a low level to a really, really high level as far as working as a small team. The Marines was a little bit bigger organization I was with. But I think I learned probably my all my team lessons from being a SEAL. Did that translate to um, all the stuff that you've accomplished outside of the SEAL teams then with it what did. you just talked about and yeah it did because i started companies adventure racing companies or obstacle course racing companies and companies they were the, the reason they were successful is because the people who gravitated around those sports first would look at it i'd look at hey yeah come be a volunteer come be a volunteer but if they were a good volunteer I'd say come on be race staff you could get paid every time there's an, a, a race and the really good ones that would you be on our staff and um, and it was we all had skills, we all had weaknesses, and uh, some of the guys were just great climbers, and they'd set up our ropes course. And some were really, really good with navigation; would help set up all the navigation. And some were the expert boaters, and they knew, hey, we need you know boogie boards here or hard boats here, or they're going to swim this section, and the water level is this high; it's going to take this long to swim the long swim. So we we took our experts and we would listen to our experts and we trusted our experts, even though you might know something about that, we let the experts make the decision. So even IT people and the people doing the social media, my way of running those companies was trust, trust the people that you want around you and let them go because all of these people are better at what they're doing than I could possibly do. And um, we all felt that way. And so if we had a team of, you know, 70 people um, and we had maybe of that probably 15 leaders, those 15 leaders all looked at their staff around them knowing this, that there's probably nobody better at setting up this swim 
than this lady here because she's been a whitewater rafter, a whitewater guide for 30 years. And there's nobody who could set up this ropes work and set up all these, like Jay, the person I was telling you about, I, I asked him to set up our ropes course once. He set up 16 miles worth of ropes and broke a world record. None of us, nobody else in the world has ever done that. So I just say, Jay, go for it. Whatever you're going to do, we're going to like. And, and and I think that that side of teamwork, just knowing you've got the best around you and you trust and know they're the best and let them go and do what they do. That 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 was a big lesson I learned um, when I got out of the teams and, and started putting businesses together. And then when I was in the, you know, and I'm still involved with the government, uh, going overseas, and you're only with two or three guys usually, and they're usually, you know, former military, special operations type guys. That definitely requires teamwork too. Even though you might be with a Marine, you might be a, a Delta Force guy or another SEAL or a government guy, you all came from slightly different backgrounds, everybody with different uh, standard operating procedures, everybody with different mindsets almost on how to accomplish the mission. And and I should back up. I was in El Salvador once with this guy. He was a Delta Force guy. And we had to lay in the grass, this tall grass in enemy territory. There was a 10-year war in El Salvador that nobody ever talked about. And we were there for that. And they lost over 50,000 people the side we were on. And this guy, Cheetah, was telling me, I am so fed up with all these people here. He said, every morning they decapitate someone, put their body in the river, and I have to pull up these bodies, and then I have to go preach to our people human rights. He said, and, and I'm listening to this guy go, what a big mouth. All he's going is on and on and on and on. So we're in this high grass. We, I didn't see eye to eye, but we had to lay in the grass for a long, long time, but we got to know each other. And um, and then he told me he was in a punk rock band, and he'd take these intestines from animals and put it in his stomach. And as he's singing, he'd start cutting up his stomach shirt and all these intestines would come out saying, this guy's crazy. This guy, I don't like this guy. <laughs> but then he told me what his songs were about. And they were about people coming back from war and how damaged they were. They were really songs that had great meaning to him. And then um, he was, you know, he's just been in war so long. He was, he was, he was loud. He was just wasn't the type of guy I was liking to be around so much until I learned more about him. Then we really became good friends that night, just laying in the grass, but talking about the SOPs, the standard operating procedures and the way you think differently. Him coming from Delta Force, me coming from SEAL team, I was used to small unit tactics. He's used to bigger army. So we're laying there in a war zone, and then we heard something, and then it got louder and louder. And I had Levi's on and like a camouflage shirt on, and he's like just the same. So we jumped up behind a tree, and his, he said, let's go attack. I go, no, let's stay behind the tree. Let them come to us. We have cover here, cover and concealment. He goes, no, no, let's go attack. Big army, big units will think of attacking. If you have just a few guys with you, you think about staying undercover and let them come to you. Well, you know, so we went back and forth. He wanted to attack and I wanted to stay behind that tree. And the noise got louder and louder and louder. We took our safeties off, we're pointing on each side of the tree. And this big cow came out and we just cracked up laughing, you know. And uh, we just had differences in philosophy, uh, but it, um, I could see where he was coming from. He could see where I was coming from and uh, things like that you have to overcome. But when you have groups of four or five or six people, teams of four or five or six people, and they come from four or five, six different walks of life and to create a team that that takes some work, especially if you're doing military operations and one of the guys might be a government person without military experience and they're risk adverse and they don't want to get in trouble or afraid they're not going to get promoted or um, things escalate. But when you have a good team, you kind of all have a mind melt and you all start thinking alike and, and you don't, you're not afraid to say, I'm really bad at, I'm really, really bad at navigating on these roads without GPS here in this Middle East country here. I'm really, really bad at it. And I'm terrible at language. I'm terrible at computer skills. If you just say, and that, that was me, I was terrible at all those things. Mm -hmm. And other guys um, would say, well, I'm I'm really, really bad with weapon assembly or putting together weapons, or, you know, I'm not very good at, you know, shooting from a moving vehicle, for instance. And uh, so you help each other out. 
and um, the strong help the weak, and we're all weak some parts of our lives, and we're all strong some parts, and a good team helps each other out, and they, they kind of go with one unified force and one mindset that's uh, that's alike. In the beginning, when we had when we first started on the show, um, you mentioned when you quit running, uh, um, and that was when you, you know, didn't have the mindset and that's when you quit for the first time in your life. Um, was there something, well, you mentioned you learned about teamwork in the SEAL team. Um, was there a point where you like failed in teamwork or or something happened where you learned teamwork to develop that teamwork where you put you know, it's a lot of testosterone, a lot of ego, a lot of power, you know, um, how do you put the, how did you learn, like, to put that aside? How did you learn about teamwork and, um, you know, working together? Was there something that happened to you that triggered it or? I would really love to be able to tell you that um, every team I was on was just solid and we all got along, but that wasn't the case. You know, um, once in the SEAL teams, uh, was small was part of a small team and there was so much friction and I, I still think about it all the time why didn't that work and once with the US government with a small team same thing happened I said am I the common denominator I was thinking what what are we doing wrong here why aren't we working as a team twice in my life that happened and I think about it all the time it still bothers me um where at those two times the team didn't work and it wasn't fun. And we, I don't know if we all had, I don't think we all had different objectives, but um, there was a lot of testosterone. And sometimes that just like two, you know, magnets trying to hit each other. It doesn't work, but that I don't know the answer to. Um, I, I, and it still bothers me. I guess not all every team is going to work if every single person on the team was able to let go of any things that bother them, able to talk about it, able to accept it, able to still focus on the mission. And if all of that was happening, I suppose that wouldn't, a team wouldn't fall apart. I never had a team that blew up or failed, even in adventure racing that's happened where a team doing, you know, spending 10, 11 days together and going through all these mountains and rivers and lakes and, Sometimes, and I've seen that a lot as a race producer where a team would explode and they're all great people. They all want to finish the race. They all had experiences. I really don't know why that doesn't always happen where if they were sitting here talking to probably everybody on those teams, I'm thinking about that where it didn't work or it did explode, would probably tell you the same thing I'm saying, the ingredients you need. But why those ingredients didn't work for those specific teams, I don't have, I don't know that answer. I really don't. And the the times it um, it didn't work for me has bothered me my whole life, really. It's interesting when um, when I started training with a seal, um, Coach Mack used to always say, um, "My teammate is more important than me." He said, "Learn that lesson. Learn that lesson. Your teammate is more important than you." And yeah. I mean, I was training with all these guys that were getting were getting ready to go to Buds. And he said, this is what's really going to help you guys is learning this. And I remember when he first said it in my mind, I was like, teammates more important than me. I was like, I'm important <laughs> too, aren't I? Like, what do you mean? And it took me a couple of weeks to really understand what he meant by that and how to focus on your teammate. And Every And for me, it was really, really hard. I mean, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, physically, mentally, emotionally. I mean, it was a, it was hard. And I remember one time when it really was clicking, we were we just came out of the water. It was freezing. It was dark out. There were standing in formation. And it's so cold and coach Mac is just talking and I'm just like, Oh my gosh, like what, <laughs> when are we going to do something? Because this is just miserable and you can't show that you're absolutely freezing. And I remember looking at, at the person next to me and he has goosebumps all over his arms and he's purple like me. 
and his lips are 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 purple and moving and and I'm just like, oh my God, he's just as cold as me. Like he's just as cold. And I said, focus on him, focus on him. So I moved a little bit closer and put my arm against his arm for um some body heat. And as I was focusing on him and helping him out, I became less cold. And yeah. as and as that was happening and I was actually experiencing it, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is what it means when it's my teammate is more important than me because everyone's going through the same hell. I mean, it's, everyone is having the same pain. But when you could focus on everybody else, your mind is in thinking about you. It's off of you and it's on her. And um, it helps me to get through it, it helps everybody to get through it. And that's when I first really learned in that moment um, the importance of teamwork and focusing on your team um, to complete something. So, that's such a good example. Yeah, that's such a good story. And and I, and I know what you mean by that. And I think really, I should have included that, but I think what you just said is probably as important and more important than all the other things I said, to be able to have compassion and to know how your teammates are thinking or feeling and forget about how you're doing it, but try to put yourself in their shoes. And, you know, um, I, I listen to a lot of um, world leaders and, and things. I try to spend two hours a day doing this and just to listen to people who are running for office and things. But I like what RFK Jr. said about that. He said, if you, if one country can put their um, attention to maybe how, the other leaders are thinking, for instance, Putin, why did he attack Ukraine? Well, maybe he's not just some bloodthirsty, crazy guy. Maybe he doesn't want all these countries on his border with nuclear weapons pointing at his country. We should probably start trying to open up our minds to think how the enemy thinks. And if, if we're able to do that more often, to think how your teammates feeling, not like you said, not constantly, oh, poor me, poor me, I'm so cold. Oh, my buddy, though, look how cold he is. I'm going to warm him up with my arm and give him, and now my attention is going to help in him. That helps you both. And um, I, that's so important, what you just said, I think. I think that's one of the best examples of what a good team would make and a good leader, too, because um, some of the best SEAL leaders I ever had were the guys, they're the first thing in the morning. They're the first ones there. They're the last to leave, and they could care less about their career all of their energy, and you felt this with everything they did and said, was for the team. And when you felt as a, you know, that your leader has your back no matter what, and he or she is there only for the team, like you were for your teammate, I think that makes an exceptional leader. And that leader can have all types of flaws, but the team will ignore those flaws, knowing that leader is there with the most interest for the team and and selfishly giving all this attention and interest to the team and not him or herself. I think what you said was just right on. I think it's funny because, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask you this question, um, but it's funny the lessons that I've learned, how it um, helped me succeed in other areas of my life. And I did a civilian SEER program and I was absolutely terrified. I, my family's never camped a day in their life. I'm about to be hunted in the woods. I'm a bit high maintenance. How am I going to get through this? And I kept asking everybody else in, in my team how I could help, how I could help, how I could help. And I remember these guys that were just like as big as, you know, my, their biceps were as big as my body. And I remember being like, how can I help? I'm here for you guys if you guys need anything. And they just be looking at me like, what are you going to do? You're five feet tall. Like, what are you possibly going to do for us? But it was also to, to, I was terrified. I was really scared about what was going on. And it also was to help take the focus off of me, get out of my mindset and, um, you know, and help everybody else, you know, and do something for the team to get out of my head. Um, for you, what, um, what did you learn? um in training or time as a seal that is carry that you've realized and we're kind of shocked by that actually translates to um everyday life i have an answer for that one because yeah. 
And it took me forever to figure out how to get this down in a few words. And all the time, I'm always answering phone calls and texts and emails. People want to be SEALs or Rangers or something. And what's my advice to them? And or how to finish this tough race or anything. And finally, I have it nailed down. And I, I mentioned my little grandson was here visiting a little while ago, and he's nine. And I, I, I taught him this every single day. I said, Sawyer, really, um, during our visit, um, and for the rest of your life, I hope, um, because this is what I tell other people, young guy, the younger you learn this, the, the more, more important it is, or the more the better it is for you. But if you want to do something challenging in your life, and you can change these four categories, but and and the best triathlete in the world taught me this because I said to him once, I said, Dave Scott is the greatest triathlete in the world. Right before he won his first Ironman, I said, Dave, how do you stay in such great shape? He said, Well, Don, I don't take any days off. The doctors are against me, and paying the light bulb went off. Okay, I'm not going to take any days off. I went over 22 years without a day off of exercise, like hard exercise. All he had to do was put that in my mind. So then I kind of taken that philosophy and I, I extended it a bit. And so now what I have told myself, what I tell others, my little grandson said every day, every single day, get up and do something to make yourself stronger. If you can do 40 push-ups, do 42. If you go to CrossFit, go to CrossFit, go to your weight room, do Pilates, just get stronger each and every day. And don't expect someone to hand you that workout plan on a silver platter. You figure it out and get stronger each and every day. And of course, it's best to monitor and record your results. Number two, every day, do something to make yourself faster. If you do something that requires running, you're going to have to do hill repeats, fart licks, long distance running, the LSD running, the short sprints, but you have to get faster each and every day. And we would go running in the mountains every day, my little nine-year-old son, grandson, and I would time him per mile. And um, I said, but Sawyer, more importantly, is every day do something to make yourself smarter. For instance, if you do want to be a SEAL, learn about these 90 plus countries SEALs are operating in. Learn about the history of the SEAL teams. Learn about the weapons. You know, learn to shoot. Learn to dive. Go take a skydiving course. But learn where these, these countries are all over the world where SEALs are operating. But most importantly, like you have shown, most importantly, every day do something good for somebody. You know, that could be your teammate next to you who's shivering. It could be your mother, your father, the neighbor you don't even know, your, your schoolmate. They, they can't carry that bag because it's too heavy. But if you do all those four things every day, when you go to selection or you go to buds or you go to whatever you want to go, even a sports team or something, you just might find you're the strongest and fastest person there. You might know more about the subject than anybody else going through that wanting to get that position you're going after. And most importantly, you're probably going to be the best teammate there because you're so used to doing things for other people. So every day we would go work out in my garage. I said, sorry, you got stronger today. Then we'd go running up on the Appalachian trail. I said, sorry, you did 20 minute miles yesterday. Now you're down to 18 minute miles, really steep hills, you know? And he said, but I didn't do anything to make myself smarter. I said, yes, you did. We did your homework together. And you got smarter and I got smarter because I didn't know the just new math. He said, but I didn't do anything good for anybody. I said, yes, you did, because you taught me this new math. So every day I tested him. I said, did he get faster, stronger, smarter, and do something good for somebody? But I think if anybody started that at any age, it's only going to be good for them, you know. And um, I can't go to bed at night unless I know what I'm going to do physically the next day. It, I can't close my eyes until what's my workout tomorrow, you know, unless I'm training for something, then it's specifically, you know, designed what I'm going to do. But um, that's, that's my favorite thing to let anybody hear is get stronger and faster and smarter every day and do something good for people. Wow. And it's, I, it's good for you too. It does good for you to do good for people. Like it made you feel good when you, you helped your teammate. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I love that. I, I am going to implement that. I am going to do that and see how, it, I mean, it, it's only a benefit. It's only a benefit. It sounds absolutely incredible. And, um, I'll check in, I'll let you know how it goes, but that sounds, that sounds amazing. And I, I just, I love talking with you. I really learned so much from you and I really appreciate you being on this show. Thank you. 
Well, thanks for having me. I really like talking with you. And also, I have a feeling you do those four steps anyways. It's been a real treat. Thank you, everyone who's been listening. Go like, share, comment, subscribe now. Be a Patreon member so you get full access to our bonus episodes and extra goodies that only our Patreons get. And tune in next week for our next episode. Thank you so much for listening.